today for chapter three at Rewritten Vintage Homestead, chapter three of The Doll Maker by Harriet Arno. And it would be a good idea if we would recap chapter two. So in chapter two, we met uh, Gertie Neville's husband, Clovis. And we learned a little bit about Clovis in just that short time. Uh, one of them was, he's very affectionate with Gertie. Um, he's amazed by the things that she can do as well. But where Gertie is um, more of a frugal person who's thinking about the future and a big picture thinker, Clovis is more willing to spend money and he likes the nicer things of, of life, whether they can afford them or not. For example, Clovis always had to have his jeans iron with a crease and he wore a brand new uh, shirt uh, to haul coal. <laughs> um, he talked to Gertie about you've never had hamburgers and I get hamburgers and I get coffee and so she you can see now why she hides her money because probably if Clovis knew she had it it would end up getting spent on something frivolous. Uh, we learned that Gertie, over the course of 15 years, has been able to save up $310, which was a lot of money to her. And she explains that that's a little over halfway um, for her to be able to buy the Tipton place. And the reason she wants that so bad is because when you're sharecropping or you're renting there in the Appalachian Mountains, you have to give half of what you earn to the person who owns the property. So this way, if she could buy her own property, they could keep whatever they earned. Uh, we learned that the little baby Amos is gonna be okay. Um, and the doctor, you know, and Gertie, they took very good care of him. He'll be okay and should be able to go home in a couple days. Uh, the doctor was an interesting character, didn't you think? He um, was so busy. Uh, he explained that the children there, many of the children there were sick never had immunizations, never had good nutrition and health care, so he was always busy. He had to travel to rural places to deliver babies. He was getting the men from the army that were passing away. So in a lot of ways, he had become numb to a lot of the suffering. He just did what he had to do and moved on to the next person. Did what he had to do, moved on to the next person until Gertie stop to ask him what happens to people when they die out in war on the field. Do they get taken to a hospital or do they are they just left to die? And that made him ponder a bit and he remembered that he had taken care of Gertie's brother Henley. We learned that uh, Gertie's mom is a bit of a pain in the butt. She's a uh, <laughs> she's a uh, very needy person and uh, she makes Gertie and Gertie's husband Clovis wait on her hand and foot and she's always having fainting spells or she's sickly and um, especially now that she found out that her son Henley died she's just beside herself and can't even cook or do anything so but I uh, she appears to have been that way before Henley even passed away so let's continue on with chapter three Clovis bent on her the same look he gave to a truck motor when it made one of its forever different sounds that usually betokened nothing more than old age and hard usage, but it was always a mystery until he solved it. Nobody'd want that, he said, but if and you must waste elbow grease on whittling, couldn't you make an ax handle or something that somebody could actually use? I ain't got no wood by me that's fitting for handles, she answered pulling a board from the box, but any kind of whittling foolishness is better than doing nothing. I'll make Cassie a real jumping jack doll. I've been aiming to for a long time. The way she's been acting up, she needs a switch instead of a doll, he said. Went off to the woods right after you left and didn't get in till just before I got there. Had mom all worry and then come in from gathering eggs and fell flat on the floor. Never looked where she was a going and broke two and gummed up the floor. Clyde was a wanting me to spank her. And eggs mighty nigh two for a nickel at Samuel's, Gertie said. And then added quickly, worriedly, 
But you didn't switch her, did you, Clovis? Now, Gert, you know I didn't. Mom wouldn't let me know how, but that youngin is an aggravating little thing. Gertie said nothing, and Clovis began wondering on what he should tell her mother to keep her quiet so she wouldn't go into fainting spells again. And after listening with many head shakes to Gertie's advice to tell her all about Amos, the hole in the neck, the needle in his arm, the tent and everything, so as to take her mind off of Henley, he went away. She stood near the door, listening until the sound of the truck was gone. She then closed the door gently, looked for a lock or thumb latch, and when she finally found none, she stood for a moment considering. Then in the same careful, no noiseless way, she took the chair, tipped it, and wedged the back under the handle of the doorknob. She looked at the child still sleeping his drug, unnatural sleep, listened a moment to his breathing, and then called softly, Amos. She called again, and when he did not answer, she took off her coat, sat flat on the floor, her legs outspread, her back against the uptipped chair, the coat across her lap, and she put her hand down through her torn pocket, and slowly, carefully, twisting her hand as if the hole in her pocket was almost the exact size of her hand, she began to bring out the warm and grimy bills. Some were folded alone into tiny squares. Others were folded two and three together, and many, like the four new bills, were crumpled hastily into tiny balls. Each she unfolded and smoothed flat on the floor with the palm of her hand, looking at it in an instant with first a searching and then a remembering gla glance. Sometimes after a moment of puzzlement, she whispered, that was eggs at Samuel's two years ago last July. And to a $5 bill, she said, that was the walnut kernel money before last winter. And to another one, that was the big Dominecker that wouldn't lay at all. She'd bring close to $2 now. Of one so old and thin it seemed ready to fall apart at the creases, she was doubtful. And she held it up to the light until she saw the pinhole next to Abraham Lincoln's eye. Molasses money, she said. She was hurrying now, eager to have it all in one pile, counting and pretending she was uncertain how much there would be. Three hundred and ten, she whispered at once, leaning back and looking at it. Fifteen years, mighty nigh, and we've got more than half enough to pay for the Tipton place. Her, wor her words had been loud. She sprang up and looked down at the child. The waxy earlobes were beginning to show a faint trace of pink. Oh, honey, she said, no working away and giving half to the other man like's been the life for Reuben. Soon as your poor daddy gets out of the army, we'll get us a place of our own. Gertie held the Bible open at Ecclesiastes. She stood with her back to the open front door and faced the five children. Amos, still a shade pale and thin from his sickness of three weeks back, sat on a sheepskin rug near the heating stove. The four older ones, neat and quiet in their Sunday clothes, sat in a row between the two beds that stood one in each back corner of the big, low-ceiling, small-windowed room. Her reading seemed a talking, for she looked more often at the children than at the Bible page, saying the words sometimes when her eyes went past the children to the rows of October-colored hills that lay behind her in the back window. One generation passeth away, and another generation cometh. But the earth abideth forever. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Unto the place from whence the rivers come, thither they return again. The thing that hath been, it is which shall be. And that with is done, is that with shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. She stopped her finger under a word and cleared her throat and looked at the children. 
what the old preacher uh, recollect he was a smart man he was the son of David means I always thought is to tell us that whatever kind of luck comes good or bad it has already come to somebody for us right now there's trouble all over the world and trouble right in our settlement but it won't be forever I'll 12 year old Reuben her oldest boy alone was listening he searched her face frowning and with one hand absent-mindedly pulling against the blanket roll of the old wild cherry wood bed he had her eyes and bigness of bone and cast a face a straight mouth and still gray eyes solemn that to a stranger might seem sudden but the trouble won't go away he said uncle Henley can't come back Clyde, the biggest girl and two years older than Reuben looked up from staring at her little silver guitar string that hung on her wrist that her uncle Henley had sent her Henley had sent her the bracelet when he wrote his last letter from a place in Texas he had sent more things to her than the others for she had been his favorite though in look she was not akin to him at all thin boned and pretty Clyde was with her father's large shiny brown eyes and chestnut colored hair worn always in two thick braids each formed of three smaller ones so that now as she sat with a bowed head weeping the braids come came away from the middle and they seemed like folded satiny wings upon her head and her face unlike Reuben's was not ugly in sorrow and held no anger no questions that would never be answered because there were no answers she turned to Reuben with a sisterly rebuke it was God's will that they took Henley off and killed him if he'd have been a bigger richer farmer hush Gertie said it's been happening to men since the beginning now listen to old Ecclesiastes I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift nor the battle to the strong neither yet bread to the wise nor riches to men of understanding nor yet favor to men of skill but time and chance happens to them all all us you gotta you gotta recollect youngins that a sober hard-working man could go hungry and a good man go to jail but the children weren't listening Clyde sniffled looking at her guitar uh, bracelet Reuben was thinking of Henley and the others were too little Enoch the nine-year-old sat stiff in his chair like a boy having his picture taken his new overalls were neatly creased from Clyde's iron as he had directed his hair was parted his eyes were on his mother but with a critical almost accusing glance Amos the baby one and not yet four studied two hickory nuts between his outspread legs Cassie sat on a block of wild cherry wood as quietly as she was ever able to sit wiggling and giggling and whispering Gertie looked at her sternly until she sat consciously still her thin legs that looked even thinner above Enoch's last spring shoes held carefully straight and still by the block of wood her arms folded over her stomach her hair the color of silk escaped from the braids that had fallen across her bright dark eyes laughing now in spite of the prim straightness of her mouth Gertie went on at last but only Cassie's eyes were upon her as she read for man also knoweth not his time as the fishes that are taken in an evil net and as the birds that are caught in the snare so are the sons of men Cassie with a low laugh had slid off the block of wood her bottom striking hard against the floor she turned and hit the rock of wood you mean young and quit the, quit a pushing me she said in a bubbly voice Gertie folded her lips together and looked hard at Cassie what am I doing Cassie Marie Cassie flipped her hair out of her eyes the backward motion flinging her head against the block of wood and leaning so with her head against the wood she considered her mother's question 
Why, I reckon you're trying to preach to us like Samuel. Clyde cried, make her behave, Mom, acting like a heathen. <laughs> and Enoch corrected, Mom can't preach. She's not so much as a church member crazy. Somebody's got to teach you in the Bible. Don't you know, young'uns, that a long, long time ago, a way back a forever old John Kendrick, you recollect the grave that's in our graveyard, and many's the time you've heard your grandpa tell how he rid a mule into the Battle of Brandywine, and how that mule outswam them horses. Well, anyway, long time back, before he was born, his people weren't allowed to read their Bibles. In them days, the Bible cost a heap of money, and nobody had to read them on the sly. But more than anything, them people, they was your people, recollect. They wanted a place where they could read their Bibles when and how they pleased. And now, just because our preacher's gone to Oak Ridge, and there ain't enough people left for Sunday school, that's no reason to do without the Bible. We need it worse right now in this evilest time. She looked at Reuben. Can you say the commandments any better than last Sunday? The children grew even more restless and slow-tongued. Reuben struggled through the Ten Commandments, helped at times by impatient promptings from Clyde, who already knew the commandments, the blessings, and the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> Gertie looked once behind her through the open door and frowned a little on the uh, shortening shadows of the house, but continued with memory work. She listened while Enoch repeated the blessings swiftly and tonelessly, going ever faster when he reached, Blessed are we when men shall revile, revile, revel, you, and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. His words were blurred as those of a too swiftly played phonograph. Clyde, carefully and with pronunciation, different from her everyday speech, recited the psalm that Gertie had suggested she learn. God is our refuge and strength a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth be removed. Clyde finished, and together they recited the Lord's Prayer. But before the prayer was finished, Clovis, long since through with his Sunday shaven in the kitchen, cleared his throat impatiently, and hardly was there an amen ended, before the line of children broke apart and Clovis reminded from the kitchen door, Gert, we gotta get to going. Your mom's already taking it hard cause you ain't come sooner. And well, you know, I've got to tell my folks goodbye. He looked at Enoch's troubled face. You know, go visit him, I mean. It ain't like I was leaving you next week for good. Yes, Gertie said, but was still looking through the window towards the hills. Clyde was crying again. The other children were silent too, and Clovis, when he did speak again, was all choked up and hoarse. Oh, Clyde, honey, don't go carrying on. It'll maybe be over before I even go. Gertie drew a sharp, quick breath and then turned to the children. Your Grandma Neville's wants you all to come today. Uh, when your poor pop goes to, she managed to smile. Law, he's just been going for a visit. She managed to smile. A body you think from all your carrying on that Wednesday he was a going across the water instead of just going to get his examination. And I don't want a one of you to be a sniffling and carrying on about your daddy going off in front of your granny Neville's. Now recollect, he's her boy and she's got three gone. Her voice got hardened. I gotta go see my mother, your grandma Kendrick. I ain't been to see her and Pop since your Uncle Henley. She couldn't go on. And anyway, Enoch, looking over ever more accusing, was saying, you're all is saying that everything's going to be all right. And Uncle Henley is dead. And Uncle Jesse, he's been a missing so long. He's same as alive, said Gertie with a loud conviction. Clyde recovered from her tears and looked accusingly at Cassie. Mom, can't you make Cassie Marie go with you? 
I just can't make that young and behave. Uh, the other day, when you was gone with Amos, she kept asking Granny Nevels, when was Uncle Jesse coming home? Like she didn't know it was nice six months ago that he went missing in action. Telegram come, and that Uncle Jesse's most likely alive, Gertie repeated. Keep your Grandma Nevels a-thinking that. They wouldn't get to from a, a, such a little family and a little place. Now we'd better get to going now. Cassie Marie, honey, I guess you better go with me. She saw the disappointment in the child's face at losing a trip in the coal truck to see her favorite grandmother and comforted. We'll have us a pretty walk through the woods. And then to Enoch, pulling on his jacket as he ran to the coal truck. Recollect no sniffling now. Be good and make Grandma Neville's happy. Reuben lingered in the doorway. Mom, can I go a-hunting? I see Grandma and Grandpa Neville's Friday when I hold him up some wood. Couldn't I go a-hunting and then help Grandpa Kendrick with his night work this evening? He looked hopefully but doubtly at his mother. And then at Clovis, who was getting Amos into his coat. Your Grandpa Kendrick would be mighty glad to see you, Clovis said. But you know your mom and me, neither one of us hold by hunting and carousing on Sunday. Especially when Henley's when there's so much trouble going on in the settlement. Gertie looked through the door and past the rented ridge field to the hills, warm looking and soft and kind in the yellow, yellow autumn sun after the frosty night. He's worked hard all fall, she said. Down at mom's and here and saving that hog messed up in the corn in the rain. She drew a shivering breath. Henley would maybe a gone a hunting today. Clovis picked up Amos. Well, whoever's riding with me, come on. And he called as he started for the truck. Clovis was put out, Gertie realized, by her unreligious ways in letting Reuben hunt on a Sunday. Still, she had no heart to forbid the boy to go. He had already gone for the little 22 that Henley had given him on his 10th birthday. Enoch ran to help Clovis with the business of filling up the truck radiator which he had drained the night before against the frosty cold, while Clyde got the many-layered jelly cake that they had baked yesterday for Grandma Neville's. Clovis poured a thin trickle of gas into the carburetor, and in an instant, a blue flame whooshed up, and as always, Clyde squealed, Yay! Jip the dog barked, Bruff! The younger boys cried out in delight, Yay! And Clovis, his eyes beaming with, with gratification, said, She started! <laughs> Only Reuben, walking now through the last summer's cornfield where the thin blade strip stalks rose no higher than his shoulders, did not glance at the truck. Don't be a shooting me and Cassie now, son, Gertie called above the sound of the motor. Recollect we'll be coming down through the woods past the old Tipton place. He had walked slowly on, given a little sign that he had heard her warning. But at the words tipped in place, he stopped short. And then he turned and he looked at her. That tipped in place. It's pretty, isn't it, Mom? He seemed eager to say more, but after a cautious glance toward Clovis, lifting Amos into the cab, he only looked a moment at his mother. His eyes narrowed in thought. He turned swiftly about then and strode across the field. Gertie watched him and nodded with satisfaction over the way that he carried his rifle. Clovis and the other children were calling and waving goodbye. She stood a moment longer on the porch and waved and watched the battered truck go lurching down the old rutted lane. A low laugh caused her to look behind her, and she hurried back into the middle room, saying with more sorrow in her voice than chiding, Cassie Marie, quick kick in that block of wood. You'll ruin it. She, melt, she knelt down and smoothed the wood with her apron and examined it for scratches. Cassie, who'd been lying on the sheepskin, was kicking the wood with her heels. She was troubled and patted the wood as she, kneeling now, leaned her cheek against it, whispering, I didn't mean to hurt you, honey, honest. And to Gertie, with a contrite, hair-flipping head shake, I forgot she could feel it, Mom. Him, Gertie said, 
rising but looking down onto the top of the great chunk that stood high as Cassie's shoulders. Her, Cassie said, her eyes gay again, teasing. She flung her arms around the wood, laughing and pushing hard to make her fingers touch the other side, and as usual, they would not touch. And then she cried, you're so fat, you're as fat as Grandma Kendrick's feather beds, you old fat thing, you. And your hair's not braided yet. I'll get it in your eyes, Callie Lou, and you'll be cross-eyed, Callie Lou. Still hugging the wood, she tilted her head far backward, looking at her mother, begging, part her hair and make her braids, Mom. It was an old argument between the two of them, the hair on the block of wood. For if one were close enough looking down in the good light, like when the early sunshine fell like a curtain by the southern windows, not falling through but making a brightness in the room, the shape of the top of the head with unparted hair swirling loosely away from the center was very clear. The waving hair might have twisted into curls on its ends, but the curls, like the face, were buried in the wood. There was only the top of the head, tilted a little, bowed or maybe looking down, but plainly someone was in there crouching, a secret being hidden in the wood, waiting to rise and shed the wood and be done with hiding. Gertie bent, reaching for the sheepskin, and at once the top of the head with its wavy hair was lost below the, po the protecting rim of the wood, and the bright dark block seemed cherry wood only. But Cassie continued to fondle it, begging, Take her out, Mom, it's Sunday. She wants out. She's been waiting there so long, so awful long, ever since I was little. Way before then, Gertie said, smoothing the sheepskin over the wood. He's been waiting there in the wood, you might say, since before I was born. I'd just bring him out a little. But one of these days, just you wait and see, we'll find the time and that face in him will come out of that block. So every now and then, Gertie got this huge, big block of cherry wood from her grandpa. And she's carried it around with her for years. She works on it when she can or when she's inspired. And so far, you can tell it's a head bent down and it's got a part and hair, uh, but there's no face. And you really can't tell what it's doing. And we'll find out more about that later. Well, she'll never be whittled into door locks. She was for door locks, but Grandpa Kendrick, give her to you. She's too fine for door locks, the old man said to Grandpa, and she's fine wild cherry wood, said Cassie. They don't make wooden door locks with wooden keys no more, Gertie said, going for her coat, looking about her to make certain that the room was fit to leave. She shook her head over the ugliness of the tin heating stove, looked with satisfactions on other things, the rag rug of her mother-in-law's weaving, given to Clovis as a wedding gift, the ceiling high wild cherry sideboard put together with pegs, the wild cherry bed in one corner with the tops of the high head post carved into shapes of acorns, bigger and heavier than even the black walnut with the pure round uncarved knobs in the other corner. All these wooden pieces had belonged to her father's grandmother and had been cast off from his house to the barn when her mother came there as a bride. She was hurrying down the lane toward the gravel road before she realized that Cassie, instead of talking to Callie Lou, as was her custom, was talking to her almost in tears as if she said over and over, but I got a memory verse, Mama. You never did ask me if I had a memory verse. You learned it to me, she said when Gertie turned around and looked about her. All about those shoes and gold and silver and the man that had kept the sheep. Gertie took the child's hand and Cassie began in her skipping, whispering voice. That we may buy the poor for silver and the needy pair for shoes and sell and sell and sell the golden crowns. Uh, now, 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 my girl, you're getting things a little mixed up in the Bible. The poor don't have crowns and sell the refuse of the wheat it goes. It means, I reckon, that the hungrier some people is, the richer some people get. Nothing makes sense, she went on, tucking a wisp of Cassie's hair into a braid, without the before and the after. But you done good, real good, to get some old Amos by heart. 
When I read them to you the other night, I never thought you recollected him. You're such a smart girl. She added, and she reached for a cockleburl that was on the child's dress. But Cassie had darted out of arm's reach and was now tiptoeing for a late hanging leaf near the tumble-down rail fence by the lane. But I can't learn to read, Cassie said, holding the leaf above her head. And for an instant, she was troubled. And Clyde and Enoch, they learned how to read before they was as old as me. I can't even learn. Oh, don't fret. You'll learn, Gertie said, trying to put a hearty conviction into her voice. They had never in all their moving about as renters lived less than two miles from a school, so that even before the war she had taught the older ones much at home in bad weather or when they had no shoes. And since the war had taken the teachers, she had taught them all almost entirely at home. The bigger ones had gone ahead in their books, but Cassie, who could learn anything by heart, had never, in spite of Gertie's, Gertie's efforts, learned even her letters. Cassie lagged again, and Gertie, hurrying down the lane, gave a slow head shake as over a puzzle as she listened to the child. Now who was in the road and was hidden in the bush, trying at times to skip in her two big shoes, now and then singing snatches of her wordless songs that almost always ended in bursts of laughter or low murmurs. A moment's silence and then Cassie sprang into the road in front of her, whirled about and stood laughing, crying as she pointed to her shoes. Looky, looky, I've got red shoes like Tildy. She had between the laces on the coarse, crooked shoes, struck some uh, freshly fallen black gum leaves that lay brilliant red along the road. They're sure fine shoes, Gertie sh said. Where'd you get them? Montgomery Ward, and they cost $40. La, la. And how'd you get so much money? Kelly Lou's man. He's gone across the ocean to the wars, and he makes good monies. Callie Lou, she brought me the shoes and six more pairs, golden slippers with silver heels like, like we see in Needle Eye. And where's your old man, said Gertie, catching at her hand. Cassie laughed and ran backwards ahead of her. Oh, my man, he ain't much account. He lives in the holler heart of a big dead chestnut tree. She was spinning around, running away, one hand out, the fingers carefully curved, her face turned now and again toward the curved hand, while some smiling tank went forth to the playmate, who ran down the road by her side. The child's prattle faded, and Gertie heard the plop of a falling, frost-sweetened persimmon, the clop of her shoes in the Sandy Ridge Road, the cowbells, her own Lizzie's was near the others far away and faint, but mostly she heard the silence. She walked even faster, running away from the silence and the emptiness. It would come Henley, never the soldier. She had never seen her brother as a soldier. He had, like others from their settlement, been trained 16 weeks and shipped across with never another sight of home. Always he came into silence as a farmer, blue shirted, a lock of black hair falling down between his slate blue eyes and in the silence like now or at night when the work was done and she patched by the fire there was his face with the questions why me what have i done why am i dead why unable to answer she was like a rock bluff echoing his questions why up to the stars and into the silence of the still Indian summer moons. Why? Many times at night, unable to sleep, she had got down the Bible, but mostly she sat in the lean-to kitchen so as not to wake Clovis or the children. With the book closed across her knees, the old questions that has always been asked in the Bible for her came back with Henley's one question. Job's children, did they know or question why they died to test the patience of their father? And Jethro's daughter, bewailing her fate in the mountains, had she ever, like Henley, asked, why me? Did Judas ever ask, somebody has to sin to fulfill this prophecy, but why me? She walked faster, but slackened her pace when she heard 
Cassie's prattle behind her now. She looked back and saw her hide in a wide branched pine by the end of the road and called, you could fall climbing so high. Her tone kindly with a little scolding, speaking less in fear that Cassie might fall than to fling some sound into the silence of the road, pine tree and sky. Callie Lou, she's the one that'll fall. She's clean to the top tip branch. Can't you see her red dress? Well, she better get down, Gertie said, walking on. She's looking out for heaven, Cassie said. But after a little argument with the strong-willed witch child, she sprang down and ran after Gertie, walking now in the graveled road that led the six miles to the highway. Where's all the coal trucks, Mama? She asked, coming up to Gertie. Them that hold the coal and them that dug it has had to go to war, Gertie said. She walked faster again, eager to be away from the empty road that once so fine and new, trying their settlement to the outside world, seemed now only a thing that took the people away. She turned down the ridge road by a small red gully, crept since the fall rains into the road itself with a bit of the road gravel caught in its red, crumbly sides. Less than two years ago, the gully had been the Tipton path. She followed it down through a stand of young poplars each holding still a few leaves of its topmost branches, yellow as if the tree had worn a golden crown. She smiled at one higher and straighter than the others, and she stopped to listen to Cassie calling from the pine wood around the ridge side. Make me a pine cone turkey, Mama, please. And an instant later, the child came running, holding out a fat, fully open cone. Not now, we gotta get on your grandma's expecting us. But this ain't the way to Grandpa Kendrick's. We're going a new way, down by the old Tipton place. You'll recollect the Tiptons. They moved off to Incandancy about a year last summer. And they had six youngins, one about your size, recollect? Their pop got him a job in a powder plant, and so they sold their place to Uncle John Blue. Cassie made great business of wrinkling her forehead and turning to Callie Lou. Can you recollect these little young'uns that's gone off to war? Callie Lou must have answered, for the two were deep in conversation as they disappeared in the woods. Now, I don't want you guys to get lost um, as to what's happening. So, Cassie Marie um, has a very vivid imagination, and she has a friend, imaginary friend, that she has named Callie Lou. Uh, her brothers and her sisters, that drives them crazy. <laughs> but we also uh, can see that Cassie uses Callie Lou as a coping mechanism too. Gertie hurried, hurried on through the gloom of the young, close growing pines over a tumble down rail fence and through the Tipton new ground cornfield. A rocky slope bit of hillside where the sumac and beech and oak sprouts grew higher as their shoulders and the wild grape vines and saw briars caught at her coattail and made traps for her feet. Twice she stopped and scratched at the earth with her fingers. Each time she smiled for the soil was black and loose still, almost as good as fresh new ground. She crossed a second rail fence and tumbled down like the first but mended with pine brush piled in the corners and two strands of rusty barbed wire. Below it stood ancient black trunk dying, dying apple and pear trees, almost lost in the sumac and scrub pine that were smothering the growth of sage grass. One tree with a few knotty red apples still clinging leaned tipsy like a tree not quite blown down. But on going closer, she saw the gully deeper than she was tall, a red wound in the hillside, stealing the earth from the tree. She threw in some fallen dead apple limbs and a few sand rocks, whispering as she walked away, that'll hold back the dirt and keep this hillside from bleeding to death. She went on, throwing quick searching glances about her. She paused by a row of black gum beehives, most tipped over, their bees dead or moved away, but a few lengths of hollow logs stood upright, each sloping roof board held in place by one great stone. Past the beehives and the orchard, sheltered by the curve of the ridge side, and on a southern slope where the early sun strung fully, 
lay the flattish bench of an ungullied land that held the house and yard and the barns and the garden spot. She smiled on the shake-covered roof of the old log house. The white oak shakes weathered to a soft gray brownness. Must have been ribbed in the wrong time of the moon for they had curled in places. And in some of the little cup-like hollows moss had grown. Now in the yellow sun the moss shone more gold than green and over all the roof there was from the quickly melting frost a faint steam rising so that the dark curled shakes the spots of moss and the great stone chimney all seemed bathed in a golden halo and cassie called that the house had golden windows some of the golden lights seemed caught in gertie's eyes as she walked down and around and at last stood by the yard gate it was a good little gate of white oak slats built to last like the old walk of limestone stepping stones half buried in the sod bordered with clumps of tansy and catnip and whorehound brightened by a great bunch of yellow chrysanthemums so sheltered here on the southern slope that they were blooming still like the artichokes that grew higher than her head by a porch corner cassie was laughing and pointing looky mom the tiptons is home Gertie, for the first time, noticed the three ewes on the porch, chewing their cuds and looking for all the world like people who have just stepped out their door to see who their visitors might be. Cassie called, Oh, how do you do, Miss Tipton? We've come to sit all day, and ran up the walk. Old John's half-wild ewes went leaping over the three great slabs of stone that made up the porch steps. Cassie ran across the porch and pushed against each of the two front doors, big stout things made of three oak planks and three crossbars, but the doors were nailed shut like the boarded up windows. Gertie touched the Tipton Dipper, rusty now with a cobweb across it, but hanging still on the nail in the porch post. She walked around the house hoping for, but never finding an unboarded window. She brushed twigs, twigs and leaves from the high shelf where the Tipton clapper had soured for churning in the summer and sweet milk and fresh meat had stood in the winter. But the porch shelf, like the punch and wash bench and rusty tin pan was empty, forgotten like the ungathered walnuts that lay thick in the grass by the porch steps, fallen from the big black walnut a little distance from the hillside. Cassie running, looking, sniffing, pointing out the wonders of the place, filled her cupped hands with walnuts and came running back to Gertie, pleased beyond measure that she, who so seldom had anything, now had something to give. She was looking at her mother when she stumbled and fell, her face striking hard against a washed out walnut root. She sprang up and stood rubbing her mouth and looking down at the spilled walnuts. Gertie put an arm around her waist Cassie, honey, learn to walk or learn to watch where you're a going. Didn't you see that root? You're always falling down. It's my shoes, I reckon, Cassie said, looking into her mother's eyes so close to her own and then pulling, pulling away, but staring still. Gertie pulled the laces until the tops of the shoes touched, but still they were loose around Cassie's thin ankles. I'm gonna, gonna, gonna get you some new shoes one of these days all of your own she said and then she added quickly sometime along toward spring it ain't like they was school and you needed pretty shoes these oldens of enix can run you through the winter cassie wasn't thinking of shoes she was crying now i can see little girls in your ma in your eyes mommy little bitty girls they're little cassie's gertie said bending her head to look at a smear of blood on Cassie's teeth so that the little girls went away. She scooped her up in one arm. We'll go down to the spring, honey, and you can rinse that bloodied up mouth in the good cold spring water. Cassie cuddled against her, one arm around her neck, her cheek on her shoulder, all her child for one instant. The other in the red dress was gone. They passed the old log barn and Gertie lingered a moment to study it. The shake roof was almost gone, but the walls were good and sound, like the hollowed out chestnut log feed troughs. And in two of the mule stalls under the good part of the roof, there was such a deal of manure. 
Her eyes on the good manure were warm as they had been on the house. They were going down the weed choked spring path when faintly from the head of the creek they heard two shots like popping sounds. Gertie recognized them being Reuben's 22. Maybe your brothers killed us a couple of squirrels, she told Cassie, but Cassie was asking for a dogwood toothbrush. Gertie cut each of them a red tipped twig from the little tree of Cassie's choice and they chewed as they went along, savoring the sharp, bitter, clean taste of wood. The leaf choked spring seeped from under a limestone ledge at the foot of a great poplar, left by generations of timber cutters because there was, rising up from the roots, a low, wide hollow fringed with moss and filled now with fallen leaves. Gertie reached into the hollow where the cup had used to be and after a little searching brought it out. Pressing it down through the pale poplar leaves, poplar leaves, she filled it, rinsed it, gave water to the child, and then drank two cups herself, slowly enjoying the water. Cassie, seeing her mother's leisurely time-taking ways, began begging again for a toy. But now, instead of a pinecone turkey, she wanted a doll. A doll with a skirt, please, Mom. We oughtn't be wasting time that way, Gertie said but was still looking up towards the house, smiling a little. Cassie saw her indecision and begged her harder. It's nice and warm now, Mom, here in the sun. We could sit on that old log and make us a doll. Gertie studied, studied the shadow of the poplar tree. It was still a good while till dinner time. She looked at the friendly moss-covered log and then turned swiftly about, the knife out of her apron pocket and open in her hand. She, she, she searched until she found a smooth barked little hickory sprout, so crooked it could never grow into a proper tree, and from it cut a piece not much longer than her middle finger, but with a little branch on either side, that no sooner were they shortened, they seemed like arms reaching above the shorter end of the wood, which was no longer the end of a hickory sprout, but a doll's head. Gertie sat on the moss-grown log and with Cassie leaning on her shoulder, she cut on each twig a tiny hand with thumbs outspread and fingers close together, like those of a child wearing mittens. Then on the main twigs, she cut between the praised hands a tiny face. Eyes and nose grew on the face and the mouth heeded Cassie's plea. Make her a laughing, Mom! And above the face, she notched the bark to form a jagged crown. And then far enough from the other end to leave a space for feet, she wringed the bark and Cassie begged again, make her pretty shoes, Mom. High heels like Gussie Duncan's, been a buying since they took her man off to war and give her big money. <laughs> They'll be mighty little, Gertie said, as she cut out a little silver for the space between the feet. Quickly, the knife point made shoes grow on the doll, dainty high arch things with, with tiny slender heels and the faint tracing of a buckle above each instep, the feet pointing downward like those of a dancer on tiptoes. You'll have to put the diamonds in the buckle shoes yourself, Gertie said, lifting her head from the work for a leisurely glance up at the hill. She could see the house and past the strip of shadow that fell slantwise of the yard, the blue grass, green as grass in the spring. The grass, the golden flowers by the house wall, the moss on the roof, the yellow chrysanthemums by the gray stepping stones, all glowed warmly as if they, with the house on the sheltered southern hillside, were set in some land that was forever spring. Cassie saw her mom's warm-eyed glances long glances while the doll lay forgotten and once after a moment's peering up the hillside she said you think that old house is pretty mom gertie nodded but pretty that's the least of it it'll be warm in the winter and cool in the summer and no matter how hard the windows blow that house will never shake and the hard north wind will never touch it Recollect, I used to come here when I was a little girl about your size a long time ago. And behind it in the hillside, there's a cellar with a smokehouse. And nothing never froze in that cellar. And in the hottest summer weather, that cellar was so cold, it'd keep you milk sweet 
and from one morning to the next. And we'd put them pears and apples in our cellar, wouldn't we, Mom? Gertie nodded, and we'd pick blackberries, our own blackberries, in our own fields. We'd never have to go asking my mommy or old John, could we please pick berries? And we'd, will we still have to give Uncle John much of what we raise? Not so much as one blade of fodder. We'll have fat hogs and chickens. Mom, make, make her a curly skirt. Gertie bent back to her work again, slitting the bark above the shoes up to the waist in narrow little strips. Then gently with the knife pointed, she lifted each strip up to the lifted arms so that there grew upon the doll a little skirt. But winter was in the wood and the bark was brittle from the fall frost or maybe her mind was not with the knife for often a fringe of bark was broken so that the skirt was a little ragged. Still, when the last strip was lifted and Cassie reached for the doll, Gertie held it a moment, smiling. So little, but there was about it something light and joyous as it smiled between its lifted arms above its dancing feet. It's a queer looking thing, she said, <laughs> handing it to Cassie. Cassie brushed the tiny smiling mouth softly against her cheek. You're awful late of getting home from school. It's a milking time and the sun's low now. And did you read your lesson good? My, my, ten pages, ain't you smart? Who's your young and your youngin's teacher, ma'am? Said Gertie, dropping the knife into her pocket and getting up. Miss Callie Lou. And there ain't no young and she can't teach to read. She's the finest. There was a scurrying through the leaves down in the hillside and both turned. It's Jip, Cassie cried and began calling him. Reuben yelled from down near the creek, and a moment later, Jip came, snipping at Cassie's cheek, leaping on Gertie, who smiled on the big jointed high behind a tree dog, and wanted to know if he'd help Reuben get a mess of squirrels. But Jip only shook himself and then lapped greedily in the spring branch. Mom, oh, Mom, it was Reuben again, his calls loud and excited. Gertie hurried over the rocky creek bluff toward the sound. Reuben wasn't fool enough to hurt himself with his own gun, and he was too much at home in the woods for fright and falls. But now the strangest of his screaming troubled her. She reached the, la the last edge above the creek and looked down, and seeing him unhurt and with hands empty, except for his gun, called in some exasperation, son, you'll never be any kind of hunter making noise enough to tangle a flock of wild geese. Reuben looked up at her, his slate gray, gray eyes laughing like Cassie's eyes. I done more than tangled a flock of wild geese. I shot a bear in the pawpaw grove, the biggest old thing you ever did see, and did he run? A bear, are you certain? Vady Sexton said she seed the track of one by her smokehouse, but nobody believed her. Gertie said, taking Cassie by the shoulders and swinging her down the ledge. It was an honest to good bear. Jip knowed it wasn't no possum nor coon, and he gave one little running growly bark, acting big like he was a aiming to fight. And that bear growled and kind of swiped toward him. You ought to have seen him, Mom. It was a sight. I shot twice to scare him. He never did run, just kind of walked off. I wish I could have killed it, though, Mom. Would they have put me in the penitentiary, Mom? <laughs> Gertie listened, her eyes almost as eager as Reuben's. The meat would have been good, and we could have had us a bear rug. But it's it's off of the game preserve. It's against the law to kill it. What color was it, son? Brownie black. He sighed, smiling a little, reli a little reliving the scene with the bear. I wish I'd have tried to kill it. Wouldn't that have been something? I wish Henley could have seen it. His face was sullen again. As in the morning, he looked down at the gun stock in his hand, the muzzle pointing over his shoulder as Henley had taught him to carry it in the woods. Gertie cleared her throat. <clears> throat> Hunting and trapping will be good this winter, all up and down the creek, and this place is close enough to the river a body could run down every little while and get a mess of fish. He looked at her, wondering why people spoke so, his thoughts still trying to grasp death, hold it, and look at it. 
He could never tell Henley about the bear in the pawpaw grove. That's what death was. And these little cedar trees up on the ledges here, she went on, speaking against the awareness of the dead, they might just make a nice fence post. He looked up the bluff side and shook his head slowly, as when after awakening shaken a summer before daylight, he tried to waken. Ain't this grandpa's land? She shook her head. It used to be your great grandpa's. Your great great grandpa Kendrick owned all the land between here and the Ridge Road, clean down to the river and up to the head of the creek, nigh on to 4,000 acres, I've heard Pop say. This is the Tipton place now. Oh, he said, and he started up the bluff side. Cassie, in no wise excited by Reuben's bear for bigger bears, Chase Callie Lou, cried, Could we put bear meat in our cellar too, Mom? And we'll can a million cans of blackberries. And not so fast, my girl, that was just talk, Gertie said, but turned to Reuben. They's the best garden place of more manure in that new ground. It'd be a great deal of work to clean it up for somebody else, Reuben said, looking at her face. Well, maybe it won't be for somebody else, she said. Reuben studied her for a time of silence, afraid to believe. Pop wouldn't like it, he said at last. It's too far from the gravel. Anyhow, he'll be in needing a new truck or new tires or new something, like he always does. He won't need nothing in the army, Gertie said. He'll want us to have a place of our own. That is, once and I got it. Pretty soon we won't be having to give away half of what we raise. You've been saying that a long time, Reuben said. But un unable to hold the doubt on his face, he plunged up the hill, not just walking through the woods, but stopping now and then to study the trees. And once before he disappeared, he saw him take his pocket knife and cut a little crooked cedar away from a straight one so that the straight one would grow.